Summer of the Monkeys, Chapter 10 I woke up the next morning with a pounding headache and twice as sick as I had been the day before. My whole body screamed for water and my throat was so dry I had to jiggle my Adam's apple three or four times before I could swallow. I had such a nasty taste in my mouth, it reminded me of the time I had eaten some green persimmons. When I first opened my eyes, I couldn't remember a thing. For a few seconds, I didn't even know where I was. Everything I looked at was going round and round and round. Then, little by little, the spinning stopped and things started coming back to me. The monkeys, the whiskey still, drinking the sour mash and the loss of my britches. The more I thought about everything that had happened to me, the more ashamed I became. I tried covering my face with a pillow, but that didn't blot out a thing. I was lying there feeling sorry for myself and wondering how Rowdy was making out when Papa and Daisy came into my room. Papa smiled and said, how do you feel? I'm sick, Papa, I said. I'm sick enough to die. Papa laughed and said, oh, I don't think you'll die. You may think you will, but you won't. In a day or two, you'll be as good as new. Papa, I said, I didn't know that sour mash would make you drunk. I thought that it had to be made into whiskey first. Shaking his head, Papa said, oh no, sour mash will make you just as drunk as whiskey does and twice as sick. Once that stuff gets down into your stomach, it just keeps on fermenting and you'll be sick. Up until then, Daisy hadn't opened her mouth. She just stood there looking disgusted and listening to Papa. Turning to leave the room, she said, well, I guess I'd better get busy because it looks like I have my work cut out for me. I was so sick that I didn't pay much attention to what Daisy had said, but I should have known that I was in for another one of her Red Cross go-arounds, and that's all there was to it. I didn't have to worry about Mama paying me a visit because she was really put out with me. This didn't bother me too much because Mama's mad spells never did last very long. My name was just about like any other boy's names. She would stay mad at me for a little while and then she'd start feeling sorry for me and everything would be all right. Papa said, I can't understand why you drank sour mash. I know that you found stills before and I'm pretty sure you didn't drink any of that mash. I didn't, Papa, I said. That was the first time I ever drank anything like that. Everything happened so fast. The first thing I knew, Rowdy and I were both drinking a little, like drinking it like water. Papa sat down on my bed and said, Suppose you start at the beginning and tell me all about it. I'd like to know just what did go on down in those bottoms. I could always talk to Papa much better than I could to Mama. It seemed like he could understand me better. I figured it was because he too had once been a boy. I told Papa everything that had happened, but I was so ashamed about losing my britches. I didn't look him in the eye while I was telling it. Papa laughed and said, to me, it looks like those Jimbo monkeys wanted to get you and Rowdy drunk so he could steal your britches. What do you suppose he did with them? I don't know, Papa, I said. He could be wearing them for all I know. I wouldn't put an, anything past that monkey. Papa said, well, I can't see where there's been too much harm done, but I don't believe I'd tie into our sour mash anymore. It might get to be a habit, and that's not good at all. Papa, I said, you don't have to worry about me. I won't be drinking any more sour mash or any other kind of whiskey as long as I live. If drinking makes a fella as sick as I am, I won't ever drink again. I mean that too. Papa smiled and said, you know, if a fellow can learn something through experience when he's young, he doesn't ever forget it. I won't ever forget this, Papa, I said, and if I ever get a hold of that Jimbo monkey, 
He won't forget it either. Papa laughed and said, I've always figured that a man can do almost anything if he puts his mind to it and doesn't ever give up. I won't ever give up, I said. I'll catch that monkey, and if I have to chase him clear to Arkansas. Getting up from the bed, Papa looked at his watch and said, Your mother and I are going to the store today. Is there anything you want me to tell your grandpa? Is there anything you want me to tell your grandpa? Just tell him that I'll be up to see him in a day or two, and that we'll have to figure out some other way to catch those monkeys. Papa smiled and said, I don't suppose you want me to tell them about how you lost your britches, do you? Oh, I don't care, Papa, I said. Mama will tell Grandma all about it, and she will tell Grandpa. As long as we keep it in the family, I don't mind it so much, but I sure wouldn't want anyone else to know about it. Chuckling to himself, Papa left the room. It wasn't long until I heard our wagon leave and screech its way up the road. I had just about dozed off when, to my surprise, Daisy came into my room. She was all decked out in that silly-looking Red Cross uniform and was carrying a tray with a large bottle of castor oil and an empty water glass sitting on it. I couldn't see that she had a book tucked in under her arm. I thought, oh no, if she gives me a dose of castor oil and then starts reading to me, I will surely die. It was the same old thing I had gone through a hundred times. Smiling all over, Daisy said, Good morning, and how is my patient this fine morning? Oh, for heaven's sake, Daisy, I said, Please, I'm too sick to go through any Red Cross business this time. I don't believe I could stand it. I thought that you wanted to... T I, I thought that you went to the store with Mama and Papa. You always do. How come you didn't go this time? Oh, I wanted to go, Daisy said. I wanted to go very much. But Jay Berry, a good nurse, never leaves a sick patient. You didn't have to stay here just because of me, I said. I'm not that sick. I never will be that sick. For all the attention Daisy paid to my, to my protest, I may as well have been talking to a post oak stump. Taking her thermometer, she stared, she started shaking it. I just groaned and crawled way down under the covers. Daisy started pulling at the quilt, saying, Jay Berry, you're acting like a little baby. You sit up here now and let me examine you. Go away, I shouted. I'll be all right if you'll just go away and leave me alone. For a few seconds, there was a complete silence. Then I heard Daisy say, Well, it says in my nursing book that when a patient gets unruly, a nurse is supposed to be stern. Reaching down under the covers, Daisy grabbed a handful of my hair. I was squalling like a scared chicken as I was pulled to the, he pulled to the head of my bed and propped to a sitting position with a pillow. Now, Daisy said, sticking the thermometer into my mouth, if you'll just be patient, this will be over in a few minutes. I was too sick to fight her anymore. All right, I mumbled. If I die, it will be your fault. Daisy smiled and said, Jay Berry, you won't die. You may think you will, but you won't. In a day or two, you'll be as good as new, I hope. You're just saying that because you heard Papa say it, I said. No, I'm not, Daisy said. I'm saying it because I'm a nurse, and nurses are supposed to cheer up their patients. I knew all too well that once Daisy had gotten into one of her Red Cross nursing spells, it was ridiculous to even think of trying to argue her out of it. So I just groaned, closed my eyes, and sat there while she looked me over. Counting silently, Daisy took my pulse. Then she looked at my eyeballs, felt of my brow, and tapped around on me with her fingers. She even laid her ear on my chest and listened to my heartbeat. From the expression on her face, I seemed to be in pretty good shape until she took the thermometer from my mouth and looked at it. 
frowning and letting out a low whistle. Daisy said, boy, Jay Berry, you have a fever. Why, it almost busted this thermometer. This scared me a little. I knew that I was sick, but I didn't think I was sick enough to bust a thermometer. Daisy said, let me see your tongue. By this time, I was getting a little bit on the nervous side. Without any protest, I stuck my tongue out as far as I could. Daisy looked at it, and making a sour face, she said, Yuck! Jay Berry, your tongue is so coated. It looks just like the inside of Papa's shaving mug. This really shook me up. Is that bad? I asked. Oh, it's not too bad, Daisy said, but it's bad enough, I think. I know what's causing it. You do? I said. Well, what's causing it? Daisy said, remember when Papa said about your stomach being full of that old sour mash? As long as it's in there, you'll stay sick and your tongue will be coated. Daisy, I said, I'm sick all over, but it's not my tongue that's sick. What are you going to do now? I don't know, Daisy said as she reached over and picked the book, picked up the book she had brought with her when she came into my room. I saw that it was her nursing book. Daisy wet her thumb on her tongue and started thumbing through the pages. Jay Berry, she said, I don't know a thing about doctoring a drunk. I've looked all through my nursing book and can't find anything that tells me how. But I know that somewhere in here, I've read where it does tell me how to keep a patient's tongue from being coated. Daisy, I said, you don't think that I'm drunk, do you? Just because I got drunk once doesn't mean that I'm a drunk, does it? I'm not too sure about that, Daisy said, still turning pages and not looking at me from what I've heard and read that that's the way drunkards get started. They have one drink, then they have to have another one and another and another, and pretty soon they're drinking it by the barrel. Daisy, I said very seriously, if I live through this, you won't have to worry about me ever drinking any more mash or whiskey. I promise that. Why, I'll even cross my heart and hope to die. With a, with a very sad look on her face, Daisy said, I hope not, Jay Berry. I sure would hate for us to grow up and have people see you staggering down the street and say, that's that old drunkard, Jay Berry Lee. He's Daisy Lee's brother. I don't believe I could stand that. I just wouldn't put up with it. I'd tell people that I didn't even know you. Aw, oh, Daisy, I cried. I'm so sick now. I'm not an inch from the grave, and you keep talking about all those old bad things. I thought you said that nurses were supposed to cheer up their patients, not bury them. Just then, Daisy's face lit up, and she said, Ah, here it is. She sat down on the front of her bed and started reading in silence. Finally, after what seemed like a week to me, Daisy sighed, closed her book, and said, Jay Berry, I think what you need is a big dose of castor oil. I always did think that the very thought of castor oil was enough to make a buzzard sick. Castor oil, I said. Why, Daisy, I couldn't take any of that nasty stuff. All you think about is castor oil. If I even mash my fingers, the first thing you do is grab that old castor oil bottle. Oh, Jay Berry, Daisy said, taking the stopper from the bottle. Castor oil isn't hard to take. If you just close your eyes and swallow, you can't even taste it. I can taste the darn stuff, I said. I can taste it even if, even before, I take it. Holding the bottle about a foot above the glass, Daisy started pouring. The very sight of that slick, slimy looking stuff gurgling down into the glass was more than my poor old stomach could bear. I jumped up out of bed, flew to a window, and threw up all over the place. As I was crawling back into bed, Daisy giggled and said, Jay Berry, I'm a much better nurse than you think I am. I knew that I'd have trouble getting you to take castor oil, so I did the next best, best thing. 
I just let you see some of it. I figured if you saw some of it, that would be enough to get you to rid yourself of that old sour mash. It sure worked, didn't it? I bet you're feeling better, aren't you? I guess I am, I said. But if you really want to do something for me, go and bring me a gallon of good, cool water. Daisy giggled and said, Aw, oh, Jay Berry, you couldn't drink a gallon of water, could you? You just think I couldn't, I said. I believe that I could drink 10 gallons. Well, Daisy said, if you think that you can drink that much water, there's no use in bringing it in a glass. I'll just bring the water bucket. That's what she did and stood there watching while I drank three dippers of water. Boy, Daisy said, if you and Rowdy keep drinking water like that, we'll be lucky if we have any left around here. How is, Ra how is Rowdy getting along? I asked. Daisy frowned and said, I don't know how he's getting along. He won't let me get close to him. Surprised at this, I said, won't you, won't let you get close to him. What's the matter with him? I don't know, Daisy said. He went out to the barn lot and dug him a deep hole down in that damp ground under the watering trough. About every 10 minutes, he crawls out of his hole, rears up on the trough and drinks water. Every time I go out there to see about him, he growls and shows his teeth. I can't get close to him. Did you have that nurse's uniform on when you went out there to see about him? I asked. Jay Berry, Daisy said, a nurse always has her uniform on when she's doing her work. You should know that much. I laughed and laughed, even if it did hurt my old head. Daisy, I said, Rowdy is no fool. He knows what that uniform means as much as I do. He's sick and he doesn't want you messing with him. I don't care, Daisy said. I'm going out there one more time, and if he growls at me, I'm going to take a bucket and fill that hole full of water with him in it. You'd better not, I said. He's liable to chase you up a tree. Sure enough, it wasn't long until I heard a big racket out in the barn lot. Rowdy was barking and whimpering, and Daisy was yelling and scolding. Pretty soon, everything quieted down and I knew that old Rowdy had been overpowered and was getting the Red Cross treatment. I felt sorry for my old dog, but there wasn't a thing in the world I could do about it. I just pulled the covers over my head and went to sleep. Papa was right when he said that in a day or two, I'd be as good as new. On the morning of the second day, I crawled out of bed, feeling almost like my old self again. Oh, I was still a little nervous and a bit wobbly on my feet, but otherwise, I felt pretty good. As I walked into the kitchen, the family was sitting down to the breakfast table. Papa and Daisy started whooping and clapping their hands like they hadn't seen me for 10 years. I knew they were kidding me, so I grinned, sat down, and helped myself to a double portion of everything on the table. Eyeing my loaded plate, Papa smiled and said, when a fellow started, starts eating like that, he sure isn't sick. Oh, I feel pretty good now, Papa, I said. Right away, Mama started laying the law down to me about my drinking. She told me that if I ever did anything like that again, I could just pack up my clothes and leave, and I could take that drunken old hound dog with me when I left. Daisy giggled and said, Mama, if Jay Berry does leave home, he won't have to do much packing. Those monkeys got away with about everything he owns. Why, they even got away with his britches this time. I wanted to argue with Mama and Daisy, but I realized that I didn't have a leg to stand on. So I just sat there, mad all over, hating monkeys, and more determined than ever to catch every last one of them if it took me until Gabriel blew his horn. Mama said, I guess I'll have to stop by my work and make you another pair of britches. Papa laughed and said, it looks like I'm going to be minus another pair of my overalls. Overalls in our family really got a good wearing out. Mama made mine from the backs of the ones that Papa wore. 
Papa wore out the front and I wore out the back. Jay Berry, Daisy said, old Rowdy's in pretty good shape now. I finally got him to drink some warm milk and I gave him a good cold bath in the watering trough. As soon as I had eaten my breakfast, I went out to the barn lot and sure enough, there was Rowdy just lying on the ground and looking as if he didn't have a friend left in the world. I walked over and patted my old dog on his head and said, I know how you feel, boy. In fact, I don't see how you made it with Daisy messing with you. Rowdy was so sad he wouldn't even wag his tail. Come on, boy, I coaxed. I'm going to the store to have another talk with Grandpa about those monkeys, and he might give you a meat rind. That was all it took to get him to come with me. On my way to the store, I stopped to watch a sight that all but left, that all but left me breathless. To my right, from far up on a hillside, there was a loud gobbling and a beating of heavy wings. Then up out of that green blanker, green blanket, and into the sky rose a flock of wild turkeys. I blinked my eyes at the burst of fiery bronze as they winged their way through the bright rays of the morning sun. Rowdy and I watched until they faded from sight in the thick timber of the river bottoms. Boy, Rowdy, I said, wasn't that something to see? You just wait until I get that gun. We'll have an old gobbler on our kitchen table for breakfast, dinner, and supper every day until I'm old and gray-headed. A little farther along, just as Rowdy and I rounded the bend in the road, I stopped and stared in wonderment at the sight directly ahead. Here and there on the long sloping hillside, milky white splotches stood stood out like split buckets of milk in the deep green. The Ozarks most beautiful flowers, the dogwoods were in beautiful full bloom, mixed in with the green and white, the deep glare of red, bud, red buds gleamed like railroad flares in the dewy morning. As I stood there drinking in all that beauty, I said, Rowdy, Daisy says that the old man in the mountains is taking care of everything in the hills. If he is, he must have worked a long time painting that picture. I had been so busy looking at all of that Ozark beauty, I had forgotten about the monkeys. When I did think about them, I said, Holy smokes, Rowdy, we better stop this gawking around and get up to the store. Grandpa will think that we're not, that we're not coming. To make up for lost time, I, st I stared off. I started off in a dog trot. Grandpa wasn't in his store when Rowdy and I arrived, but I knew that he was around somewhere because the door was wide open. Then I heard a loud banging coming from the barn. I walked over and found him purring like purring a new spoke in one of his buckboard wheels. As Rowdy and I walked up, Grandpa smiled and said, Hi. Hi, Grandpa, I said. With a, with a sly look on his friendly old face, Grandpa looked all around, and then leaning over close to me, he whispered, I've got a jug hid there in the corn crib. Would you care for a little drink? I knew that Grandpa was kidding me, so I grinned and said, Oh, Grandpa, you know I'm not drinking, man. Grandpa said, Well... I didn't think you were, but your papa told me that you and Rowdy got on a pretty good tutor. I guess we did, Grandpa, I said, but it wasn't our fault. That Jimbo monkey got us drunk. It seems like every time we get, we get close to those monkeys, they make fools of us. Why, they even stole my britches this time, and I never will live that down. Grandpa exploded in laughter. He laughed and laughed. He laughed so hard. He laughed so hard that great big tears boiled out of his eyes and ran all over his face. I even laughed a little myself, but I wasn't laughing about losing my britches. I was laughing at Grandpa. 
Rowdy thought that because Grandpa and I were laughing, we were happy, and so he got happy too. He wiggled and twisted all over the place. Grandpa finally got over his laughing spell and reached for his old red handkerchief. He took off his glasses, wiped them, and then blew his nose. Now that we've had a good laugh, he said, I think it's time we started thinking about catching those monkeys. We can't let them get away with stealing a fellow's britches. Grandpa said, I haven't done anything but think about those monkeys and my thinker is just about wore out. I don't know what to do now. I've tried everything from A to Z, and I haven't caught one yet. Oh, I don't think we've tried everything yet, Grandpa said. There's a lot of space between A and Z. Now here's what you do. You go on home and be ready about daybreak in the morning. I'll come by in my buckboard and we'll make a trip into town. I was really surprised to hear that we were going to go to town because I didn't get to go to town, but about once in ever so long. What are we going to do? What are we going to town for, Grandpa? I asked. We're going to find out how to catch those monkeys, Grandpa said. That's what we're going for. Grandpa, I asked, all interested, do you know someone in town that knows how to catch monkeys? No, Grandpa said, shaking his head. I don't believe I know of any monkey catchers in town, but I think there's a place where we can find out something. What kind of place is that, Grandpa I asked. The library, Grandpa said. I thought a second and said, Oh, I know now. That's the place you were telling me about, telling me about where they have all of those books, thousands and thousands of books. That's the place, Grandpa said. I don't care what kind of problem a man has, he can always find the answer to it in a library. Somewhere in one of those books, we'll find the answer to our monkey catching problem. Boy, Grandpa said, we should have thought about the library a long time ago. It sure would have saved a lot of wear and tear on Rowdy and me. Grandpa looked at me, then he looked at Rowdy, smiling, he said, I can't see any wear and tear anywhere. You both look like you're in pretty good shape to me. Rowdy had seen Grandpa looking at him and figured out this was a good, was as good of a time as any to let his wants be known. His old tail started thumping the ground, then he opened his mouth and let out a ball that scared the chickens out of the barn. Grandpa said, what was that all about, boy? Rowdy whined, turned, and bounded for the store. On teaching, on reaching the porch, he stopped, looked back at us, and bawled again. Frowning and looking surprised, Grandpa said, what's gotten into him? I couldn't help chuckling a little bit for I knew that Rowdy was trying to tell Grandpa. Oh, Grandpa said, don't pay any attention to him. He just wants a meat rind. Watching Rowdy bouncing up and down on the porch, Grandpa said, he seems to know where the meat rinds are, all right. Maybe we'd better get him one before he has a nervous breakdown. Rowdy wound up with a big, fat meat rind and I got my usual sack of candy. I thanked Grandpa and told him that he wouldn't have to wait for me in the morning, that I would be ready and waiting. <laughs>